Are we you live? Click, you clicked it, it's live. You probably are realizing right now, I am not Tom Lawrence. I'm Brett Chittum, and Tom wanted me to do this funny thing because I thought I'd stop by his office and say hello to him. Well, Tom, you better take over and get right. me out of here. That's where Brett gets lost. All right. <laughs> not really, but yes, I can't talk about this stuff. <laughs> Ah, oh, fun stuff. Let's see, what do we got here? Did I have the right time? We do. It's welcome to Vlog Thursday, episode number 218. Are they episodes? Um, I don't know. I just had to kick everybody out of the studio. There was, uh, like, people ask in the office, hey, when are you guys, when are you doing Vlog Thursday, Tom? No one looks at Twitter because I'm the only social media user here. And, uh, I had to get them all out, and everyone still showed up, and I chased them all out, and now uh, here we are. So anyways, <laughs> lots of fun, lots of fun. Actually, let me turn my noisemaker off. I think I got my phone is, uh, let's make sure it's muted. All right. <clears throat> now, the last few Vlog Thursdays, I made that noise, because this was over there. Now it's over here, because I've been filming. If you can't tell by the shirt, the... Uh, device and the logo behind me right up into the uh filming of this and me pressing the live button i was actually sitting here f catching up on lots of details related to the 45 drive server here so i'm actually um getting it really close to being done i have the physical layer completed as far as that video i just don't have the software layer done but there's where opportunity lies to all of you who would like to tell me what you'd like to know about this. And uh, so, hey, why not? We'll just cover some of the 45 Drive stuff, even though it wasn't in the title, um, which it will be now, because I can edit a title even while the thing is live. Contractors, 45 Drives, Storage Server. There we go, save. In real time, I just changed the title of the blog, so now the blog has a new title. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that works anyways so welcome all of you smash the like button and uh, that'd be great there's 78 concurrent viewers but 18 likes at the moment so go ahead and do that i'll just repeat that once in a while because it does seem to help the channel um let's see cool 45 drives and uh people been asking about hot sauce and we were just when i took a break from recording um, because our studio and kitchen area is one here, uh, because, and we like hot sauce. So this is habanero garlic salt. This stuff's amazing. And uh, it is, it has been, oh, this stuff is so good. It's really pretty cool. Um, it It's one of those things that I don't think I can recommend enough, but it also at the same time, it aerosols really, really well. What I mean by that is it's so powdery that when you put it on things, you should probably wear some type of face protection. Uh, we don't, and uh, we usually end up with a little bit of habanero in the nose every time, but it's worth it because this stuff is that good, is an additive to things. It is made by the Electric Pepper Company. Um, it is a hardwood, hardwood smoked habanero garlic salt by the Electric Pepper Company. I don't know where this comes from, but uh, one of my staff may drop a link or something inside the chat. So anyways, <laughs> oh, fun stuff. <clears throat> How power hungry are 30 hard drives? We haven't got to that part. Um, I didn't put a kilowatt on it, but obviously, it's going to vary a lot. So giving it's not the most relevant thing to ask how much power it uses because it's how much power does it use in this exact configuration will be answered. It is not going to answer necessarily how much power it will use in your configuration. The different drives have different power profiles, although they're not dramatically different. And of course, if you can afford an all flash array, that power goes down quite a bit. Uh, but nonetheless, the, um, uh, the whole... Uh, review of this is getting very close to being done and I've been pretty excited about it because it's definitely uh, been a lot of fun. Uh, this has Ubuntu and ZFS on it, by the way. <laughs> Drop test and see how many drives are lost. Yeah, that would not be good. So definitely um, could be an issue if you did that. Hey, we got all kinds of fun people. Hey, from Denmark. Hey, from Switzerland. Hey, from Chicago. We've got a lot of areas and a handful of countries covered here. But uh, nonetheless, one of the things I want to cover today 
or at least discuss, will be this. We can log into it. Um, we can log into the 45 drive server. Uh, we can see what the Houston command interface looks like. I've shared a few screenshots. I've talked about it before. This is some of the disk information. I don't have any data on it, so we can keep destroying and rebuilding the drives. I just booted it up. Therefore, this is what it does the first time you open this up after a boot because it just indexed all the drives and will tell me things like if these drives are part of a pool, like this particular drive is right here. So these are the fun aspects I'm going to be covering in the software. Uh, it's only about 10 minutes, maybe 10 or 12 minutes of me covering the hardware and then um, the, we are going to dive into software. That's how that video works so far, provided I don't re-record it. Because once I get everything finalized, occasionally sections get re-recorded, or if I think I missed something, I add it back in. That's the behind the scenes for how Tom makes videos. And thank you very much, William, for the spice donation. That is very helpful and much appreciated. Ooh, Hungary and the Netherlands. Uh, there was no dropping. Um... There was no dropping in this particular server, but uh, there, there's at least a few jokes dropped in. So, uh, uh, let's see. The drives, for example, let's... Um, maybe you guys can help me uh, write the script for the jokes. So far, <laughs> so, so far, what I have in terms of uh, that is going to be... There are 420 terabytes of storage. Now, this is not blazing fast storage, but when we fired it up, it worked pretty well. Makes a decent amount of noise. Uh, in 420 terabytes of storage across 30 drives is resilient enough that we shouldn't have our data going up in smoke. So <laughs> let me know what else everyone thinks of that. Um, let's see. Yeah, audio is fine. When the audio is out of sync, because I've known this myself, if you reload the whole page, it fixes it. Because I've seen it get out of sync for me, too. So, FYI in there. Yes, subtle stuff. Um, I need an EU franchise. I have no idea how to franchise things. I've taught... This has actually come up a couple times that people said, hey, build a franchise. And I'm like, that's easier said than done by quite a bit. Uh, so, that's definitely... It's not easy. By the way, this is on and running, um, so uh, this isn't very loud either. That's actually part of the review, is uh, this idles from the front at idle, not full tilt, uh, with the fans at about 50 to 55 decibels. Uh, so it's actually, and there's some noise cancellation uh, that my setup here has, so you don't really hear it. I don't know if I can easily, while it's live, turn that up. But it, you're talking about a enterprise server that's quiet enough for me to do a vlog live next to it. So, yes. We be... Oh, hash checking the data. Oh, that's a good one. I like it. But, um, yes, we'll be hashing some data on here. Uh, what fans does it have? You know, I don't know exactly, like, the brand of fan that is in here. Is it... I'll let the pull one out to look. That's a fair enough question. I didn't cover that in the hardware, but, um, they're rel They're not, like, the Be Quiet fans. They're not the weird, uh, brown one. Is it brownish color? That the Be I've used the Be Quiet ones before, but I forgot. I think they're, like, a brown color. And, uh, yeah. Noctua. Noctua's brown ones. Okay, one of my staff just told me that Noctua makes the brown ones. <laughs> uh, I will... I The fans themselves are yay big. They're, uh, whatever the full-size case fan is. Noctua's are brown. So, they're actually standard case fans? I guess that's worth mentioning. Uh, now I have more things to film on the hardware side. I'll have to re-bring that up. But that's alright. I'm, I'm okay with doing a little more. Um, I love knowing this now, and it's way better to know now what I should have in the video. So the millimeters of the fan, we'll make sure I add that in there to get it correct. Noctua industrial fans are black. I just can't see the model number on this. I guess I can open the back of the case. I think I can see it from there. So we can open... We're taking it apart live! San, San Ace 120. Does that mean anything to anybody? San Ace 120 fans. 
So there we answered the question. I'll insert that information into the video. There we go. Oh, now I got to get the case on right. Details. Taking things apart live on a show. Why not? There we go. That's done. Uh, can I? Um, kind of. It, actually, for those curious, this might be something interesting. Can you figure out where people are from? Actually, you can. So if I go to, and let me pull this up in the back end to figure out where this is. What does Google know about you? Um, is it under reach? Hold on, we're going to find it. Traffic source types. I thought it was under audience. Hold on, we're going to turn and switch the screen over in a second. They moved it. There we go. It's under geographies. These are the geographies. So United States makes up. 42% uh, of my audience from there, United Kingdom makes 7%. So it's actually United States, while makes up the majority, it makes up just under half. I mean, at 42%, that's, um, yeah. But definitely I have quite a dispersion from all over the place. Unless you're using VPNs and pretending to be somewhere else. I don't know, maybe that's where a lot of people are. Uh, so it goes United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Germany, Australia, Netherlands, India, Sweden, Poland, France, Philippines, Brazil, Brazil, I'm saying it wrong, uh, Denmark, Belgium, Italy, Norway, Portugal, Switzerland, Spain, uh, Romania, Singapore, Mexico, New Zealand. There's not a lot of people in New Zealand, but... Uh, compared to some of the other places, but that's still a pretty good New Zealand turnout. I don't think there's, I always thought New Zealand was like, it's a beautiful area. I always thought it was bigger in terms of population, but I remember reading somewhere it didn't have quite the population I thought. Either way, that's the breakdown for all of that. <clears throat> UK's number two, watching from Germany. Uh... Nice. Yeah, the 45 drives is cool to work with, so I'm sure they'll they'll definitely customize something if you wanted to. I, my entire interaction with them has been really, really positive. Like, everyone I've worked there with has been awesome. Um, no, no complaints there at all. New Caledonia. I don't even know where that is. Sheep outnumber people in New Zealand. Those are fun facts that are uh, interesting to know. So that's, hmm, total unit weight? I don't know. I'd have to bring a scale. I don't have a scale here. So I guess, I mean, it weighs a lot because it, it's mostly the drives. It's actually the device doesn't weigh too much, but once you put the drives in, the drives have a lot of weight to them. Most of the weight is, the drives weigh more, 30 hard drives inside of this, weigh more than the entire unit. So... It's really the weight of the... We can probably figure out the weight of the hard drives and weigh them individually or look at what they say their weight is and multiply that times 30. That would definitely be an easy way to calculate at least that much of the weight. But the drive, the system itself is not... I mean, it is really solid uh, construction. I don't know how well that comes through on the camera, on the audio, but yeah, that's definitely... It's definitely well-made and... Uh, heavy gauge steel that they made it out of. I think that helps contribute to the quiet nature of this system. The fact that it doesn't have, um, you know, thin or flimsy steel to kind of resonate or echo. Uh, yes, this is a Q30 model. I wanted it quiet because it's going to live in the rack behind me. Uh, that's actually where its home is going to be. And I wanted to be able to have something in here that's on, that I store data on, that also isn't noisy and disruptive for recording videos. Are we talking business today? Yes. Why not? Uh, it's supported back and front on rails. Yes. The final piece I am going to do is stick it uh, in the rack on rails. So I do have all the rails. I just had it have it up here, and I didn't bother putting the rails on it until I'm done with the hardware review, and then I'll put the rails on it. Um, it's actually got 
uh, spots all the way along the whole end of it were for all the rail mounts. Um, they do not use multiplier backplanes. They use a pretty, um, a pretty normal system. And let me see if I can find the link for you here. Um, that shows exactly how the backplane connects. I know there's a video or a not a video but a um a link that I'll be including. There we go. So you guys can see what it looks like. I I have my own videos of this but I that video is not done so I can't share it with you yet. This is what the backplane we're using looks like. Um it is non proprietary as far as the connectors go. It's a standard SAS expander. So the uh parts inside of this the way they used to do it versus the way they do it. Let me see if we can yeah, they don't have a high res one here. Anyways, um, the back plane that they have now used to be these individual. Now they have a solid PCB board mounted to the base. But there's nothing about this that's unusual. So you can use standard HBAs when you're setting this up. It's not it's not proprietary, so you don't have to use only certain models. It's a open architecture type design. Hopefully that clears that question up. Yes, each drive connected uh, directly. They have two HBA cards in this. So, ah, there's a video that explains the history of the company. So they actually, the reason 45 drives makes a device that looks like the backblaze storage pod is because they have a similar genesis of both being from a company called Proto Manufacturing. Proto Manufacturing is a parent company that did all the design work for backblaze. And then 45 drives is the solutions and uh, hardware seller essentially that you can buy from. So you can't buy directly from Proto, you buy from 45 drives because they do all the customization. They're a software and hardware vendor to get you a custom solution. And uh, I do talk about that in the video. So the relationship to Backblaze is yes, Backblaze people came up with the idea for this design. The benefit is it is also available to the general public via 45 drives because Backblaze is not someone you can buy the storage pod from. They also went a slightly different direction in Backblaze. They have a lot more custom because they're trying to build, you know, bucket storage or B2 bucket storage system. So it's a little bit different, but the hardware is very similar. So there is definitely a, a commonality between them. Um... Ooh, what's the, we'll get to the power consumption when I get around to the video because I don't know. I, I got to find somewhere in this building the the um, the wattage device, the kilowatt, so I can tell you that. I don't know right now how much wattage it's using. I want to know. Um, I will have it for the video at the end, but I won't have it yet. Oh, uh, let's see. Similar to Backblaze. Make sure I get all the questions answered here. So, yes, th but this system is connected at 10 gigs right now, uh, and it is running Ubuntu. So besides the two eight, uh, SBA cards, the only extras that I've installed is um, they didn't ship to me with a 10 gig card, but we have, a, we have a bunch of 10 gig cards. So it does have an Intel 10 gig card in there. Um, that is the one extra thing that we put in. And let's go back over to... The internals of the system. And matter of fact, because people ask this question here, this is kind of a cool feature too. Uh, by the way, this stuff I'm showing you, like this running, this is a cockpit. I've done a video on, on the cockpit project, which is a web interface for Linux. It's pretty cool. When I did the video, um, it did not have many plugins. They have taken and made plugins. Now they brand it as the Houston UI, but they do they do not hide in any way that it's uh, the Cockpit Project. And I bring this up because if you wanted to load the Cockpit Project yourself, you can. You can go load Cockpit. You can even get these extra modules they wrote, including the ZFS module they have right here. 
So the ZFS module will work with any system, not just their system. But this is cool too. If you want to know what parts are in there, you can just mouse over it. It even gives you the ID information. It even will tell you what drives are plugged into what port. So if we go through these and, oh, there we go. It tells me the drives because they're plugged into these ports here. So I say to zero, I say this uh, one. It shows them, uh, what else do we have? It shows you what the memory. It does a reading from the memory. It even tells you that it's Samsung memory. It tells me that this is a, does it give me the part number? Uh, it just tells you that it's an HB. Oh, it does. Part number's right there. It's an HBA part number, SAS9305161. So that is a standard HB adapter. Um, pretty, pretty cool the way they do this. I just like it. it tells me what processor's in there. And if you plug other drives in, it reads that and can figure out what other drives you have. So definitely a uh, neat system. And then uh, let's go ahead and destroy this pool. Destroy storage pool. Force unmount and clear disks and destroy. While that's destroying, we'll switch back over to here and make sure I'm caught up on comments. Uh, interest in power usage for replacing a Synology. <laughs> it's, it's probably going to use a lot more power than an average Synology. I don't think these are really in the same category. Even some of the larger Synologies, I don't think are exactly in the same category of the level of storage you get with this. Um, order and delivery, that's going to be variable based on where you are, demand, and occasionally, especially the last year now, has been a demanding time for supply chains, especially if that supply chain involves a boat stuck in a canal. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know exactly the normal lead times. I, 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 It's more of one of those, hey, the issues of 2020 have threw random numbers into times. And it's not like temporary now. It's like a year later, we're still seeing some randomness between shortages on parts. So I can't exactly answer the uh, delivery time. Easy enough to contact the sales rep because it's going to be more relevant to when, when and what you're ordering. Are you ordering something that is easily available or you have a custom config of unusual parts that are less available, especially the hard drives could be a particular issue. If there's any shortages on those, it may affect your delivery time. Um, Cause that, we're dealing with that right now with a few certain line items, we can get some, but not others kind of depends. Like we've had someone just upgraded the cameras they wanted because they can get them faster because the higher end cameras for a surveillance system are more available than the lower end ones by weeks. So yeah, that one, how, how quick to get it? Um, not an easy answer right now. <laughs> yeah, the boat the boat situation. We started out 2021 with uh, sea shanties, and now we've got a boat stuck in a canal. We need a sea shanty about that, I think. Someone is working on it. I feel confident. Um, anyways, let's go ahead and we destroyed the ZFS pools. So let's go ahead and go back to creating them with all these drives in here. Uh, this is The ZFS manager is completely... And actually, let's let's pull up two of them, because why not? Why not both? Stop, Google. Uh, hold on. Something else I wanted to do. I got a couple things I got to pull up and log into. Then I will switch screens. Now that I'm logged in, I can switch. There we go. Come on. Got to close all these extra windows, then I can switch back. There we go. So this is an Ubuntu server I configured and set up. By the way, hey, look, there's a ZFS manager. Look familiar? This is not running on 45 drives. This is what I was talking about, how you can just load their module from their GitHub and have ZFS set up and running. And I, I think that's just really cool how that works. So you can go here. I don't have any extra drives in this, so I don't have the drives to select, but there's all your ZFS, but no disk to select. Let's go over here and build a storage pool. The YouTube live pool. And then from here, we change it over to device alias. 
Now, these device aliases match the drives themselves and their physical locations, and that's important because you'll be able to see how this works now in a second. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, we got ten drives in RAID Z2. We're going to leave these other ones out for now. We're going to go ahead and hit Create. Now, you can do this from the command line as well. Um, it's reading the ZFS pools from the configuration for ZFS, so uh, it, it's one and the same. That's actually a cool thing. I, I might do an updated video on how the whole cockpit project works. It's actually really clever because of the way it reads configuration files. It doesn't have its own separate configs it's creating for these. It is reading from the Linux config files. But now we have those drives, and now we can, if we want, extend and add more drives. I think it's here. Oh, wrong button. Still figuring out where a few things go. It seems like it's that. Um, whoops. Is it the top one or the bot? Oh, it's up here. There we go. Add devices. There we go. Raid Z2. Now we select another 10 drives. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 add now you've got these 10 drives added in just a second add it building the uh second vdev now we're going to add a few more after it refreshes go system go <laughs> It's recalculating and re it's just re-indexing the drives real quick to see what we got. And let's go ahead and add one more. We're going to go ahead and add a RAID Z2. And all the other devices are in there too. Um, if you wanted to add things like other types of drives, I may play around in, in the future and do a few other videos. But for the basics, we'll cover this and the drives that are in it. And then we're going to click Add. <clears throat> and while we're waiting... Make this bigger. Oh man, I forgot. I added the other ones wrong. Don't worry, I can fix this. But in the short term, I can fix it later. Because um, I should have chose this. These ones I chose properly to add them by device alias. So they'll show up properly uh, and match. But I can always destroy the pool and re-bring it in. And I think that'll bring them back in with all this alias instead of this. This way it corresponds and I know which drive. So if any of these drives becomes degraded or has a problem, these device IDs correspond directly to where those drives are. So like 1-4, if we go over here to the disk and we look at 1-4, we can see that it is part of this particular thing. We can also just refresh this again if we need to. I think if I go in and out of it, it'll refresh. So I got to hit reload. Okay, now it's going to rebuild that and reread where those drives are located and which pools they're in. So if you ever have a drive with a problem, you'd be able to figure that out. So, yep, because now it says YouTube Live Pool for the one we created. It's a neat system they've put together here. So you can use Linux, which a lot of people like, and use ZFS and combine those things together really well. So I really like the way that's designed. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, I wanted to show how it worked with Cockpit instead of with TrueNAS. So the first videos I want to do with this is to show that there's alternatives out there. And it's almost funny because, you know, first people will accuse me of not covering alternatives. And then people are like, why not TrueNAS? <laughs> um, so not a big deal. Uh, eventually I will... Uh, probably load different software on there. But yeah, for now, we're going to be running it with the Linux and Cockpit. Now, part of the thing that 45 Drives does because they're a custom solution provider is they really focus on providing custom solutions like Ceph and Gluster and getting into some of those advanced storage systems. Linux just favors itself better for that. So this gives you that kind of comfort of here's at least a, a, an interface so you can get the basic functions set up, then get some of the shares set up. And they even have a video on their own site of how to join this to a domain using the web interface and get it set up to be just a big storage pool for a Windows server. And 
it's one of those things if you don't need any other features besides a very specific functions like just being a large storage node they can customize these to be that they don't need a whole custom you know specialized nas software they're just running linux so for a custom solution standpoint i think it's really interesting to be able to do that on there i mean of course they will ship it to you with true nas on there as well or you can just load that yourself that's actually when you go to buy these on their website they have all the pull downs for operating system options and oddly they have windows as an option i found that kind of strange i don't know anyone who would buy this with windows but i'm positive someone would um because that's why they have it they didn't put it for no reason so <laughs> Um, I don't know how well Webmin would handle on top of Ubuntu. I don't, I haven't used Webmin in a really long time because, uh, Webmin is just, I always found it kind of buggy and not the most, uh, comprehensive in the terms of the way it dealt with some of the configuration files. It, it's not bad. And it may have improved greatly. I did a review on it though. I did use it forever ago. I mean, talking like a really long time ago. And maybe I should give it another shot because I think any tools that make it easier for people to adopt Linux, even if it is by starting in Webmin because of the functions they may not understand very well, and it gives them a way to start with the system and customize it more later. I think that's pretty cool. Um, but it's been a while since I used it. And I think Cockpit overall is a better project than Webmin, but... It doesn't have near the features it does, but it it just Webmin's a very complete system compared to Cockpit because Webmin does have a lot of extra options in there. But I don't know, and correct me on this, has Webmin even put together anything for ZFS? Because uh, ZFS management, setting up that many drives can be a bit tricky. And uh, yeah, um, it's it, it's one of those things. I don't know if they did a whole module for that. ZFS on Linux is a more recent thing than Webmin, so I don't really know. That's my thoughts on that. Let's see if we can break this pool properly and set it up so I have all the drives imported. So let's do that experiment now. So if we go here, and we go here, and we uh, export the storage pool. Let's see what happens. All right, we exported it. Now let's import storage pool. And we're going to do it by device alias. So all of the devices now have an will be set up by device alias. See if that works. Hey, look at that. Beautiful. They all have device alias. So now if I go here to uh, disk. Refresh so it reloads all this information. Any drive we click on, it says what pool it is right here. And away we go. Very cool. Um, Mount Point YouTube. The only thing I think it has wrong, and let's look at this real quick. Maybe I didn't do something right. Oh, there you know, we did. It's showing, ah, that's an interesting thing. So we have 381 terabytes of storage, but why does this, oh, it's telling me the size of each drive. Each drive is 12 terabytes. I'm like, why does it say 12 terabytes? Duh, that's the drive. This is why, see the videos when I do them, when I do videos, by the way, I'm editing out all the parts where Tom says dumb things. Like, why does it only show 12 terabytes? Oh, because they're only 12 terabyte drives, Tom. Or 14 terabyte, 12 terabyte when they show there. So um, you think I'm smarter, but I'm not. I, I'm guessing my way through this like many of you are. I just uh, edit out all the parts where I'm guessing. Just so you know, <laughs> I share that information with you. <laughs> all right, back over here to the comments. Oh, what else do we have here? They do offer a redundant power supply. The way they achieve HA though, back to custom storage solutions, the custom storage solutions come from doing things like uh, 
Ceph Gluster and creating clusters of storage that have redundancy and resiliency between them. That's how you start stacking up entire racks of these where each one contains, each one's treated as a node and any one node is kind of like parts of a raid array. So cumulatively, we have redundancy against all of those and they build it out that way. Um, I wanna, they've done a lot of videos on this. I'm probably gonna invite them on the channel sometime, but check out their channel. They've covered some of these topics. But this is where you start talking about high level enterprise storage. You don't think about individual boxes as much. E each individual box is just one more cumulative box added to the node. So once you put a bunch of these in here and you stack them all up together, you're not worried about if one of these has something that goes wrong because it's part of a cluster of them and the data is distributed across the cluster with a level of resiliency and redundancy. Uh, cockpit looks good, but cockpit does lack features. You would be correct on that. In terms of, um, it doesn't have a ton, but I'm hoping that changes a little bit because there's some advantages to cockpit. And the cockpit project itself, I'll pull up their website. Um, they have an interesting design when you start really diving into how it works, uh, how it's self-contained, uses external APIs. The efficient one is really neat of how they did this. It only uses memory and CPU when active, and when inactive, it doesn't load on your server. When it's What it's doing is it's using the sockets that your connection to the socket is what drives it to fire off a process to bring data to you. So the system right now, because we're connected and asking data, it's using some resources. But when we close or log out, it just goes away. The resources drop to zero because it shuts down. All those services expire, the sockets close, um, and that's it. They do have, and I haven't messed much with this, but they do have virtualization in here. So I think that's kind of neat. Um, that's something I may play with in the future. It won't be part of the initial review, but I want to dive a little bit more into how cockpit works. I think for a lot of the basic high level functionality inside of your system, cockpit probably is a good system to get the job done. Also, something neat about cockpit is the ability to have more than one tied to the other. So let me do this real quick. Let's take this URL here. Actually, we'll close it. Then we're going to go to, I think you can do it from the system, or is it the dashboard page? Add new host. There we go. Host. Tom's. Add. Whoops. Oh, I guess I got to add it as the host. I got to put the IP address here. So, username, LTS, add. Oh, I got to just put the IP? I guess I just got to put the IP only. I have not used Cockpit a lot for some of these features. I just know it has, I just know it has this feature. It does have it, I swear. You just got to figure out where these things go. Probably like this, right? Will it work this way? Yeah, there we go. Cool. Now we can switch between them. So we can get one view and then hit a pull down and switch between two different logins. Matter of fact, you can group all the servers together so you can create kind of a group of servers all through one interface and kind of get an idea and look at each one and look at each dashboard for each one or look at logs across multiple servers and see any problems that were had. So this is this one here. Hit the pull down switch. Go back go over to the logs. We can look at the logs on a separate server. Uh, it's kind of nice the way they do this. Applications go right to the terminal in any one of these. It offers a nice view. Here's the dashboard view. Ah, and the dashboard view right here is where we can also switch. Back over here to system. You get the idea. You can go between each one of these. Support terminal software. It's a neat system. I'm still learning it. I don't use it that often, as you can tell.
No, Cockpit is not heavy and also not sequel based. So it's uh, pretty lightweight overall. Anyways, any other questions about the 45 Drive server that I am going to work on the review for? There's Check out the 45 Drive's YouTube channel. They have a lot of information on it. They, they get into some of the nuts and bolts and details of how to get things done inside of it, too. Uh, they are using it heavily. They are providing it as a solution and providing support for it. And their GitHub is very active. I just seen them adding, I think it was just the other day, they added another project to there. So, greetings from Finland. So, awesome. Hey, Finland. Oh, let's see. Uh, what do I think of Juno OS and FreeBSD? I don't use it, but I know some people that seem to really like it. So, you're probably referring to like the Juniper stuff. I not a juniper user um i've had people tell me they liked it i i don't know enough about it to give you any type of uh <laughs> so, um i don't i don't have i don't have enough information to give you anything really concrete on it is the 45 drive server a live stream giveaway it is not um i i cannot give this is a, a pretty well outfitted server so no i i cannot give it away um what kind of youtube channel you think this is i don't make that kind of money <laughs> <laughs> this is some expensive stuff here. I, you know what? Speaking of giveaways, I, I actually have planned on doing something like that. At one, at some point in time, I would like to do some giveaways. I do have to just figure out the proper process to do it. I have steered clear of them, not because I don't want to give things away, but because I want to make sure I stay out of any potential issues that may come with giving things away. So it's on my to-do list to do some giveaways. Um, matter of fact, I've kind of joked around like, finding someone to help me with some of the social aspects of the channel because there's probably more that could be done that I don't think about doing. So that's a that's a big piece of it as well. Uh, can I give away a screw? Hey, why not? So is that, I think that's what someone's asking. <laughs> um, looks like the Compact Pro Alliance server, interesting. Uh, hit the like button. There's 250 of you. And yeah, let's get Tom on TikTok. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not the best social media person. Not my field of expertise, folks. All right. Shift gears. Who wants to talk business? Do we want to talk business? I did put business talk and Brett had commented in joking. And Brett was at the very uh, first 10 seconds of this. He stopped by. He's my business friend who helps me with the... Uh, rack stuff that were i said rack because i see someone post in there I, I gotta stop reading comments while i'm also looking this way uh we talk about some of the uh business things from time to time and i think that's i want to do more business talks on this channel there seems to be enough people interested in me doing them so i don't mind covering them it's kind of an intersection i have between what i cover here and of course all the you know sure hardware's fun and all that but then the question occasionally comes up of well how do you do this in business related specifically to it technology business um so i'm trying to kind of figure out uh exactly how to integrate that into my channel it's kind of been a little bit of a challenge but I, at least i know when i posted that video the other day about me talking more about business it didn't seem to anger anyone that i would post that on my channel because <laughs> it's funny because jay uh, has an interest in some of the business stuff when me and jay kind of hang out and talk offline uh, which we do usually on Tuesday nights, me and Jay just kind of get together and BS about stuff. That comes up a lot. We have a lot of discussion because, you know, Jay's somewhat run a business himself for a while, but because his YouTube channel, as it's grown, has also become a business. So there's a lot of aspects about a tech business that comes up and we have kind of a talk about that. Um, um, what are the things... Uh, I don't understand the question... Uh, oh, someone's asking about Odyssey. I have here. We'll just address that right away because I think I got it bookmarked. See if I have this bookmarked about Odyssey. But I brought this up the other day. People were asking me about it. It's on my um, hit right here. Will I join Odyssey? That's always what people are asking, right? Um, one of the things I pointed out and I'll, I'll bring it up again here, and I think I brought it up last week, but just, this is a perfect example. Here is Electro Boom, the channel, and he posted on Odyssey, and I only posted this two weeks ago, 
He had a thousand views on Odyssey. He has 1.5 million views on the same video that he posted on Odyssey first and secondary on YouTube. And Electro Boom has a massive tech following. So here's another tech channel, obviously a much bigger one, but that's what I wanted to use as an example. It's hardly worth it because you get no views. Uh, there's one problem. The association of crazy, because there always seems to be a bunch of ranty, crazy people on there that got kicked off YouTube for being ranty and crazy. And then um, I have this weird association of other people on there. I just don't have an interest. I don't know what benefit it does to me. Um, I certainly, he has four comments versus 5,649 comments. Uh, people aren't commenting, but if they do comment, then they're mad because the channel owner never comments back. They're like, oh man, he never replies to comments. So I don't think there's any benefit I can see right now. Now, maybe I'm wrong, and this is the forum post. If you see it, it's called, Will You Join Odyssey? If someone can compel me, and the people asking about Odyssey up here didn't even reply to my comments, and I, you know, it's kind of that I don't have a use case for it type thing. I don't understand where the benefit is to doing it. Um, other than it always, like, one or two people ask, every live stream like well not even two i think i don't you may have been the same person who asked or maybe you're the same person who posted in my forums um the message i get tweeted it a lot uh well not even a lot just by the same couple people all the time and the same person who comments on all so i don't know you tell me um to do, do be great to see a collab between tom and network chuck um I don't know. I, you know, Never Chuck's never replied to me about the Cisco stuff. I don't know if he's mad about it, but or, or if it bothers him at all. I, I mean, I got, I just ask questions. Um, never Chuck is gives big overviews of technology, and he's very excited about technology, which is cool because I think other people get excited about technology too. I do much more in depth, and I'm a real world person working in technology, not just someone making a channel about technology. So we do have some things that we're less connected on, but he's worked in the industry a while. He's a big Cisco guy. I'm not a Cisco guy, so there's where we have a big divergence. But I think he, I don't really watch his content, but I do see it pop up because if you watch tech content, Network Chuck is sprinkled in between just like Linus and all the other channels are. So um, that's a, uh, I don't know, if if Network Chuck reached out, cool, but he's never replied to any of my Twitter posts when I asked him about the Cisco review he did um, because I pointed out some inaccuracies because when I got the Cisco equipment, because people were messaging me going, Chuck talked about the Cisco equipment. Can you tell me what it how it works? I did the video and it works different than Chuck's video. So I asked Chuck, why is your video different? Is it because of this and this? And never heard back. So I don't know why. I don't know. So nonetheless, um, I got no problem with it. But nonetheless, uh, what else do we have in here? Uh, we do not see a ton of AWS for what we're doing. We More of our clients do stuff in Azure than they do in um there's a lot more, uh, this Azure becomes kind of a more natural for clients because they, because of all the functionality you get with Microsoft. And so many of our clients are relying on Microsoft applications. I'm not saying there's zero in AWS, but AWS is usually where you're going to find a lot more people running, um, enterprise line of business applications, as opposed to desktop as a service. We don't really see as many desktop as a service, for example. So, um, yeah, Azure AD has become a very important, popular part of a lot of organizations now. So uh, Azure is, it's the whole authentication thing that Azure does with the Active Directory and with a lot of remote workers who don't have a central office, they get into the whole Office 365. It just becomes a whole complete ecosystem. Microsoft's played that really smart because they know people and the legacy love they have for things like Outlook. I mean, it's funny seeing a young startup company, they go, Outlook, why would we use Outlook? Like, that seems like a terrible idea. And then you got the other companies like, Outlook, Outlook, we can't help it. We love Outlook. We can't live without Outlook. There's no way we could possibly change without, without love for Outlook. So, yes. Um, so there's a whole, yeah, I, I don't, 
Uh, S, I don't know what you're asking, S to S to Azure. I don't understand the question. But AD is a must for most orgs, for sure. Azure AD, multi-factor, yes. Um, so, do I... I don't have any opinion in XDNS. And I don't understand what you're asking about site-to-site. -site. I mean, site-to-site, Azure-to-Azure, I... I don't understand the question, I should say. I know site-to-site -site is what you're saying, but site-to-site -site what? I Site-to-site, Azure-to-Azure? Like, do I copy data from one Azure to another Azure? I We usually don't have a big demand for Azure IPsec routing. Now, from client site to Azure sometimes, or client site to AWS where their applications are sometimes, but it kind of... But I don't understand. I mean, we've seen it. We know we know people use it. So I guess I don't know what the exact question here is. Anyways, before we get way off topic on next, I'm I'm really confused, Larry. I I don't I don't directly understand. I may have some. I, I'm gonna move over to the topics. I don't know what you're asking. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, business and contractors swinging over that. I may do a separate video on just the whole uh, contractors thing because that's a question that comes up a lot is the way we handle things and the way um, we have fewer employees but handle bigger projects. I bring that up because this is something people don't always understand is how you leverage contractors to be able to handle that. Um, and that includes contracting other IT companies. There's this weird fear I see in the eyes of some of the, I would say less sophisticated or newer IT companies. They're like, I can't give any of my work away to anyone else. I must say yes to all the things that my client ever asked that I have to do with technology and then fail at a handful of them and try to make it up and do it all myself, even though in, in, this is like the typical IT startup, um, especially in the MSP space. We do web design. We do everything but vacuum the floors at your office. If it doesn't have to do with the vacuum cleaner, we'll take care of it for you. And I think these companies kind of lock themselves in, but then they don't have a good partner resource. So I thought about talking about how to use some of the contractors to be able to leverage that and also some of the wrong ways to do it, uh, especially my favorite quote that is often terribly applied in IT by Richard Branson, an entrepreneur, and I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't remember the exact quote, but an entrepreneur just says yes and figures it out to new opportunities. And Richard Branson has said things like that. And unfortunately, I've watched IT people say, yes, I know how to do wiring. And then look around, how do I do wiring? Oh boy. And then run around trying to find the lowest bidder to get something done because they've seen the big dollars that is in a infrastructure project. It, least what they thought are big dollars, but without the competency to do it. You kind of try to make sure you have a lot of um, good contractors lined up before you look for the opportunities. Also, there's times when you don't want to be the middleman. There's not always value in you standing in between. Find partnerships where there's options for a commission where you can flip an entire project over to someone else and they kick a commission on the back end for a referral fee, essentially. That is a good, healthy way to have you not be the middleman, but still benefit from the fact that you referred people over. We do this with the website stuff. We don't do web development no more. We have a, we, we used to do it with contractors. Instead, the web people we had, we moved them over to another company, integrated all that, and now we can get a commission on sales we send over, and we're in no way in the middle of the process. They're a good company. Our clients are taken care of. Everybody is in a win-win and it works both ways. Being very friendly with that company lands us projects from them. So if they have someone who doesn't have IT or needs a mailbox migration done or something else or needs help with a IT aspect besides the website, that is something they'll refer back over to us. You can find a lot of good uh, resources uh, over time and building those relationships with other vendors is huge to the business function. I thought about maybe like figuring out some actionable items I can put together to help make that clear to a lot of people. Like this is how a lot of even larger IT companies, you know, you build your friends list, you build a friend network of businesses that you can refer things to and it helps you get things done. So, um, so what are the other questions? Oh, IT burnout. 
Huh. That is definitely a result that comes from everyone saying yes. Uh, so Larry asked the question now more specifically, uh, how common is your client base? Do you see deploying IPsec back to AWS and Azure to allow back office systems a path to cloud infrastructure mixed not not, not unheard of, but not the normal. Um, so many of the things are just using the web applications for stuff. So it's not, it's not always the case that they're doing it that way. Um, it's. It happens. It kind of depends on how you're setting up the infrastructure. I mean, if they're moving all the structure to the cloud, yes, and they have something like that, but it's not for a lot of the small businesses we deal with, it's usually not the case. Oh, uh, let's see. Guide for ad block on VPN and mobile devices. Nope, I don't cover that at all. Add information on NDAs. I don't really do NDAs. Um, that is something that's oversold in the market. That's something, um, I swear, some people, I, we, we've taken over clients like this where they, they didn't like the other MSP because they said, you know, I've, well, someone even said once, I've bought a house and signed less paperwork. And that some of these MSPs are like, oh no, here's all of our uh, non-disclosure policy. Da, da, da. Sign here, sign here, initial here, initial. Oh, here's eight, page 18. Make sure you put two initials, uh, one on top, one on the bottom. And they're like, I, can you just fix my mail for me? Um, I, I don't really understand uh, people's litigious nature. I guess it depends on how far up. I mean, once you're dealing with Fortune 1000 companies, oh yeah, you're probably going to have a litigious meeting just to get something done. We're not generally servicing Fortune 1000 companies. I'll throw that out there. We're a lot smaller than that. So we do not see as many of these type of things. Also, if you are forcing any contractor to constantly sign some type of non-compete really long thing you don't have a relationship you have a contract obligation and you're trying to you're you're trying to figure out a win-win for both of them and when people offer this to us they're like hey tom i have some business for you but i need you to sign all these ndas before i can even tell you anything about the customer i'm like i don't need the business that's my answer and that's not the answer because i'm busy that's just the answer because people like that sometimes get on my nerves um i it's funny because there's some complexities in this, but we've had someone reach out to us, another IT company that eventually lost um, some of the business kind of back to us in a way. And they were so, they were annoying me with all their, we, I can't tell you anything until you sign an NDA because, you know, we're not in your area, but we have a client that has a satellite office here. I'm like, well, we'll help you with it. Whatever. I'm not here to try to steal business. And uh, yeah, it's just one of those people are overly, um, litigious between them now non-disclosure in terms of will keep your secrets when you're dealing with a client that's a different thing and it's often the clients who are asking that uh, we have a client that makes you sign some general non-disclosures because of the technology they work on that's fine i signed on our behalf of the company with our engagement because of the type of work they do that we would be privy to by being inside their building. They would like that not disclosed of their nature of what they work on. They work on some advanced technology stuff related to um, mechanical. Uh, I can't like the part I can talk about because I've asked them. They they build these cool machines that do metallurgy analysis, neat stuff. What they care about is any metallurgy results, how they design the machines, which by the way, way over my head. All I know is just radiation warnings everywhere. I know it has to do with radiation and uh, they don't like their client list is closed. They do not brag about who their clients are because they have large clients. So as simple as that, um, those are, you know, as far as I don't mind signing that type of NDA and I've signed it with, a, um, there's another company we work with in a data center and uh, the type of things you see in data centers sometimes require NDA because there's a lot of client names that may be on things. So those, those are fine. That type of NDA, I don't have any problem with. It's these weird other people when they try to use us as a contractor. I, the relationship I have with many of the vendors is not having them sign a bunch of NDAs, being very happy that we sent them business and then them frequently sending business back our way when it's something that's out of scope for them. And building those type of relationships are healthy and work pretty well.
Yeah, if you're if you're doing anything at a Google data center, you'll probably sign an NDA. Once you get into those type of companies, um, yeah, there's that seems a little bit more likely. You purchased Netgear. Never use Netgear equipment. I have not, so I don't. I, I've not used it. Well, I have forever ago, uh, but not in recent years. So, oh, what do you think about clients that send offers that you make to your suppliers? So. This is one of those things that um, I, and I'm assuming you mean going around you. I don't mind. We've kind of given clients that option. Sometimes clients do that and we figure it out in the beginning what type of client they are. And this is something that I've seen a lot of IT people very much disagree with me on. The whining that goes on, we'll just call it whining. And I, I agree, contracts are not supposed to go this way, but sometimes you do. And what happens is companies come up with these channel partner contracts. So Tom, we're gonna make you a channel partner agreement. You're the only ones allowed to sell Sriracha cups. Let's we'll use an example here. So we're not descripting a certain company. And uh, you can sell these Sriracha cups on a subscription plan. You'll sell these subscription plans to your uh, customers. And don't worry, us as a vendor will never go around you because we're channel partner direct, so they can't be shopped. And a lot of MSPs love channel partner direct because now you don't know how much Tom pays subscription fees for, for Sriracha cups, but you know you're, you can mark it up whatever you want. This is also where the bidding gets fun when you see school systems bidding on um, Wi-Fi deployments and they have a channel partner. Matter of fact, they'll, they'll specifically only offer one brand. So all the, what the school is really asking is who wants to cut the most out of their commission uh, when it does this? And where the MSP market gets really mad is some of these companies, like the one that signed you that channel partner direct deal for cups, they realize they may be losing deals because you put too much of a markup. So they just go around you and contact your clients directly or your clients go around you and contact them and cut you out of the mix. And because the company selling Sriracha Cups is the one really providing the device, you all the time get them willing to break contract. I think it's wrong that they broke these contracts, but that's something for the lawyers to figure out and rarely do anyone um, have any real winnings with this. And this is something that many companies have gone and just cut people out. And then people go, I hate that company, not because their product isn't good, but because they cut me out of commissions and I was promised commissions. And this goes on and on in the world a lot. So um, it's now if, yeah, it kind of depends. So you tell the customer that you mark it up if you source the hardware for them. Yes, that we we charge them if that's where we have to establish in the very beginning of the client relationship. You want to buy the hardware, go ahead and buy it and we'll set it up. You want us to tell you what hardware to buy. Here's our consulting fee added on to that. You want us to buy it and provide a solution in complete. There's a different fee. So you kind of have to determine these up front. It's rare that um, there's as much of an issue with clients doing this later. They do it when you build the relationship in the beginning or when there's some major change to the company because they have new staff that do it, that does it. But it's really, it's a variation. And um, I I see too many MSPs that this was a post we were laughing at that was in one of the forums. And I thought about posting on Twitter. I don't know if this makes me kind of an ass if I do this, but what the person had said was, and matter of fact, I'll see exactly what they said because I screenshot it, but I didn't blur their name, so I can't share it here. I would, but uh, I want to look at the exact wording. And it, I don't know, it just kind of, I think they took the post down too. But this person said, recommendations for a PDF editor. We sell both Adobe and Foxit, but the margins are terrible. There's a lot of that that goes on. And I've actually had other IT people and other MSP people say things like, hey, Tom, what do you recommend for secure messaging? Uh, where they've messaged me or they post in a form and I'll reply. I like a signal for secure messaging. Yeah, but they don't have a reseller program. I th Some MSPs, if there is an interaction between the business and technology, they have to put a markup on it. Like they are determined that they have to mark up every aspect of the interaction between their client. There comes a point when the client goes, I know how much Foxit Reader costs. <laughs> like it's not a secret. 
There's times when you can provide value. There's other times when you just get out of the way going, do you really need to resell Fox at Reader on a reseller program with a better commission? I mean, at some point, is that the the nickel and diming you're doing to the customers? Because I think that comes a point where, this is my feeling on this, tell me if I'm completely wrong, but once you nickel and dime someone like that, at some point the customer's like, yeah, every time I talk to him, he's got some other thing that I don't like, but he, but it seems to have a better reseller program is what I'm impressed, the impression that you end up getting. So yeah, I don't know. I'm not big on a lot of that, so. Uh, I don't, yeah, if they get substandard stuff without you, that can be a different issue. But at some point, I don't try to get in the way. It's not that markup is bad either. It's more about, do you need to try to monetize everything, every little thing? Like, hey, they bought some type of flashy light thing. I bet we could have sold it to them at a commission or a markup or as a software or a hardware as a service. So, um, yeah. <laughs> This is one of those challenges that happens a lot I see in business. I mean, we're in business to make money. I'm not going out of my way to try to tell you some BS like money doesn't matter. Just do it because you love tech. That's not where I'm going here. I'm just trying to say the, oh, yeah, someone's uh, MSP had problems because the prices are public. Yep. And that's something like if you're only trying to sell by SKU, I guess if you're only a salesperson and not a technology person, that's the only way you can make money. Most of the money we make is by the value we add integrating technologies, making sure things work. And that's a huge sell. Now, MSP pricing is really tough because it's going to depend on what you offer and what clients you go after. There's, there's a little bit of wild west nature of some of it. And it's kind of in how you pitch it. Now, first, if you're pitching to a company that has minimum wage employees and you're trying to sell a per seat price for uh, per employee, you have a harder pitch because they, when someone's paying a minimum wage, that means I'd pay you less, but it'd be illegal. So I'm going to pay the minimum it costs me to have this labor working here. And when you start selling a per seat basis, you're also trying to add more to that cost. And the business owner is going, we're, we're trying to figure out a way to make this lower. Um, that can be challenging. Swing it around the other way, going after a client like some of the engineering firms we have. They're a way easier sell on some of the MSP because they have very expensive engineers. And if those engineers are making, let's say, $100,000 a year, you adding X more thousand per year per employee isn't that much of a pitch. If you look at it as, look, if this technology doesn't work, your engineer who's on salary for 100, 150,000, whatever that number might be, um, they can't work. And by the way, you got to pay them because they're on salary. So you want to buffer in some money to provide technology for them. That's where you can sell on a per seat basis at a higher rate because you now have targeted a business that has a higher uh employee rate. Now, if you want to sell a business on what does downtime look like instead of doing it on a per seat basis, when they have a lot of low wage labor, you don't try to do on a per seat basis. These are just some insights and perspective I'm sharing with you here. I'm not exactly the definitive answer on any of this because someone say, Tom, you're wrong. I did it this way. And I'm like, no, you can also do it a different way besides the way Tom said. So that, and that's perfectly fine. These are just some insights and offerings I'm giving you on that. And I'm not, like I said, definitive. There's other people uh, that may have some other opinions on this. There's a lot of strong opinions. This is like the frequently argued on all the different forums when you start talking about MSP pricing. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, tax implementations of marking up things. Talk to your tax attorney. Talk to your CPA. Have a good CPA for business. There's my solid business advice I always give. Um, always make sure that you have a good accountant. That is something I outsource. I do not try to do my own accounting. That would be bad. That would lead to problems. Um, the tax laws in the United States have a lot of complexities. Therefore, I have a CPA who helps me navigate those complexities. I pay him a service. He's like an MSP. He's a managed service provider for accounting. So <laughs> that's, um, I understand the pitch they have because it's, um, it's worth it. That's all I can say. Looking at tax forms is confusing and not fun at all. Um, yes. And it can go a step further. I actually, um, 
you, you can find some tax people depending on the level of service. Mine does my accounting and payroll uh, all in one. That way, only thing I have to do is let them know if there's any payroll changes. They before they run payroll, I just send an email uh, for you know do this or do that. So the um, simplicity, so to speak, is I take all the P and L I do every month, and I have a video on how to do P and L, or at least how we do P and L. It's not not a definitive video again on how to do PL, but what I what the numbers are that I look at. So I do the PL, I make sure I understand the profit and loss on a monthly basis. I put that all together. I summarize all the transactions as in I categorize them into general ledger categories. Because that's a question that I can definitely answer. I know what I purchased and what category it goes in. I put that all on the list. I don't know how good or what's the best strategy and what goes on the balance sheet and what's the best write-off strategy. That is an accountant function. I just summarize where all the money went. That way the accountant doesn't have to ask me, Tom, what's this purchase for and who's this vendor? That's, you know, uh, is it a parts? Does it go towards what they refer to as COGS or cost of goods sold? Does it go on that side? Does it go on the side of capital improvement to the building? Does it have a depreciation? That's uh, something that gets even a little bit more confusing sometimes because you can buy certain assets that don't just depreciate, they depreciate on a schedule. So you're able to claim the depreciation over time. And I know you can Google this stuff. And I started to, and I started reading it. And then I say, hey, my accountant does this. <laughs> Yeah, bookkeeping, bookkeeping versus accounting is probably a good way to describe it. So I do some of the bookkeeping. Good news is I've automated all of this. Um, everything we do here goes on a series of company cards. The company cards are all downloaded. And I use a tool called K My Money. And because we frequently use the same vendors, it's actually, um, I spend maybe a couple hours a month on accounting. It's not a big function of the business. Um, it's we just keep buying from the same places all the time. If a new vendor pops up is the only time there's a couple like, oh, what's this? And where it gets more confusing, we had to buy some WordPress plugins. The name of the WordPress plugin, the name of the company that owns the WordPress plugin, and whoever charged my credit card are three completely different names all the time. So um, that's always an interesting one. Or the one-offs from eBay, when you got to buy some random part off eBay to fix something legacy, that's also a monkey wrench of, who's this? For again, there's always a weird name on, it seems like for uh, parts companies and eBay, you think you're buying it from one company, but you're like, what, what is this weird charge? <laughs> but it's not that frequent. It's not that much of a problem. It's a, it's always a, it's a head scratcher for a minute, but not, not very long. <laughs> uh, building a zero chest network. Hmm. That's such a fuzzy term and it means a lot of different things to a lot of people. I don't know. Uh, there's not an easy way to say the zero trust network. I don't, I, I have to think about how to, how to bring that to life. Don't trust anything. There we go. Um, put everything in its own silo. No two things talk to each other. How zero trust do you want to go? Never tax an invoice. That depends on what state you're in. Uh, if you are in Michigan and you put parts on things, you will have to put tax on them as well. Uh, so there, you, you have to make sure you are in compliance with what state you're in. And where I get even more confused is there are, um, Michigan, I believe keeps it simple because you use parts and new parts are taxed the same, which to me is double taxation. I actually disagree with that, but in some other States, and I believe Indiana being one of them, uh, there is not a sales tax on used parts, but yes. Uh, purchasers from eBay never come with a tax invoice. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think they tax you on eBay. Amazon taxes you, but eBay doesn't. And it also depends on whether or not you, uh, there's, there's options for paid at source. I don't know. I'm not going to get into the details of taxes because I do not want someone to try and take my tax advice at all. I do what my accountant says to do and file the paperwork accordingly and sign on the dotted lines presented me by my accountant. Yeah, Okta's got a, I've heard of people using Okta. I had a discussion last week with someone uh, about that. It's it's all about how you want to do your authentication and things like that. I'm not an expert at it, um, so that would be a kind of a different. It, it might be a fun topic to dive into at some point in time. Uh, 
nothing more fun than finding out you could have saved a ton of money for the past decade if you built an order differently, possibly. The majority of what we charge for is labor more than anything else, especially because we do so much consulting. Uh, huge amounts of what we do, our billing percentages are labor driven, not hardware driven. Um, interesting thing is how not as much hardware goes through the company. The, the interesting, so there's different ways you can look at it. And I, I like the term peacocking because what you do, if you want to get those revenue numbers up, and this is like, if you're going to sell a company, you want to have big revenue numbers. Matter of fact, I see this, those, uh, sales training things. How do you get the company to be this many or this many or this many revenue? Uh, they, they start breaking it down like that. You know, you want to be doing 10 million, 12 million, 13 million a year, whatever that number is. But honestly, what matters is your profit. What is your profit margin? Not how much revenue passed through the company. So for example, if we had a small markup on these servers and each one of these servers is, well, this one's roughly $30,000, I think as outfitted here. If we have the client purchase a server and then we charge all the labor for the setup, most of my margin is made in that labor for the setup. But if we also ran it through my company where they bought the hardware through us and at a very low margin, all we did was shuffle money. Didn't really help much for the bottom line, but the revenue numbers look way better because look at how much revenue Tom's company did. But honestly, at the end of the day, what, what actually matters, unless you're trying to, as my friend uh, said it with his company, we're setting it up like a peacock. We run every dollar we can through the company because now our revenue numbers are much bigger. And that's what people um, start looking at when they get excited about how well your company's doing. When reality is profit is really what matters. But so it kind of, it kind of depends on how you're structuring things. And because we're a labor heavy and frequently, especially as I said, with the consulting work, we do a lot of out of state consulting that we get in jobs from YouTube. We are heavy on the labor and light on the parts. So we don't have the massive amount of money just flowing through there. Matter of fact, especially when they're out of state, we're just doing all the configuration changes. I mentioned this before because a few people said I'm a NetGate uh, reseller and I'm like, no, I'm not. I tell people, go buy from NetGate and go buy from NetGate and uh, we'll log in and do the configuration for you. We do that all the time. Um, we tell them to go, they want to buy directly from Unify. Go ahead, buy the Unify stack, buy this and we'll log in and remotely configure it. We do that for a lot of companies. Uh, do all the configuration back end. Like, why bother even dealing with the hardware and getting it here and shipping it there? Just go direct. I mean, if they want, we'll inclusively configure it and preset it up here, but we'll also remote in and do it. So it kind of depends on how you want to set things up. Oh, well, let's see. Mr. Thank you. Uh, someone says they find my videos and how they got hacked. Great. Awesome. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for the support. Ah. <sighs> Good live session. Signing off. Keep up the great work. See you later, Felix. Thoughts on using a free product versus paid product? I really, it really depends. I don't care if a product is paid or free. My basis for why I choose a product for my client is because it's the right product for my client. Not because I can make the most money on it. Not because it's the one with the best recurring commission rates but because it's the product that will suit them best. I always start there and it's really, it to me works out better that way. I always feel good about the product I sold because I think it will solve their problem. Whether that product happened to be a free tool like Signal, Signal Messenger, it's free. I've turned clients onto it, go, hey, this is cool. I can send secure messages. This gives me a great level of confidence for sending messages, awesome. I have no way to sell that and I don't care about selling it. I would rather see them use something that makes them happy um, than, you know, than I can make a better commission on some other product. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Universities of Sweden are tax exempt. Do you know if it's the same in the US? Uh, yes, there's... Uh, there are places that have tax exemptions here in the U.S. There's a there's a series of like nonprofit organizations. Um, well, nonprofit organizations are generally tax exempt, and then there's subcategories of that. So yes, I believe, and it probably depends. I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but a lot of the schools, generally speaking, are tax exempt from the hardware. Uh, and we don't tax labor here in Michigan, so that's not an issue for us. Uh, but they are tax exempt on the hardware. There's a series of paperwork that has to be filed to make all that happen. Um, 
Yes, profit is what buys things like houses and cars. <laughs> uh, normal minimal margin for hardware, probably it, it does vary on the price of the hardware, but for really higher end stuff, maybe, I don't know, you will at least want to charge like 10% or 15% on hardware. If you're going to deal with it and it becomes your baby of handling warranty and everything else, you got to put some markup on it. Um, that's all there is to it. And we, we, we very open about this when people even tell me, cause I've had people say that, well, I can get it cheaper if I buy it from Unify. I said, and go ahead. I mean, but if you want me to have the warranty and everything else, dude, I mean, you're going to have to pay a markup for that. There is a management and overhead that comes with me ordering the product, facilitating it, shipping it, and then providing a warranty if you have a problem, because you bought it through me, that means you got to send it back to me and I have to send it back to them. So that all has to be factored in. You need, you need a good 15, 20% markup to be able to deal with the issues that might be in there or more. It kind of depends on the product. Um, one of the ways we won a bid, and I talked about this, I think in another video, uh, when someone was bidding against us, we bid just labor and they bid labor and hardware. But the IT team internally understood the cost of hardware. And we even let them know if you want to buy the hardware direct, this was a large Unify order of about 300 devices. You can buy it direct and we'll set it up for you. Here's our labor charge for setting it up and here's how much you can pay. And they're like, we can save a lot of money if we buy it ourselves and then pay Tom's company to set it up. I made all the money on the labor. The other company lost the bid. Well, more than one company bidding against us because they did not offer that as an option. We're like, this seems like an easy option. I want to make money on labor. They can try to mark up the hardware and build it on there. And I'm like, look, they're IT people. They have an IT team. They're buying 300 plus devices. Let them buy the hardware directly. It's not, I mean, what do you think that they're not, they don't have a calculator. And so we're open about how much we charge. Uh, we give them a rate to install the devices and do the physical layer for them. So we were on site doing this. We gave them configuration rates and they said that seems reasonable to us and we save it on the hardware. So our combined bid was under everybody else's by the time they bought the hardware themselves and they understood they even bought some extra uh pieces that way if anything failed and it still came out cheaper than who they were bidding against so um it, it's one of those things you it's thinking about how to negotiate a win-win situation between you and a client too many people look at it as extremely adversarial and you can come off that way. If you're trying to monetize every everything in between you and the client, you end up with a uneasy feeling. They don't mind paying. They don't mind paying for your expertise and your value. They, at some point, when you tell them, don't go to Harbor Freight and buy screwdrivers, buy our screwdrivers because, you know, you don't want to buy those cheap ones from Amazon. And then you present them the cheap ones from Amazon with a 20% markup. They're like, really? Are you trying to nickel and dime me? What value did you provide? They already knew what screwdriver I wanted. It's that level of getting in between the customer. Um, it's not, this is not an exact science. It's not binary, like dealing with computers where it's ones and zeros. When you deal with humans, there's a lot of other moving components and it's about creating a win-win situation between you and the client to where both people are happy. They're happy they paid you for your expertise. They're happy that you keep systems up and running. They're happy about the choices you help guide them through and paying you for the value you created, not trying to monetize the interaction they have with every piece of software. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, and it varies from client to client because we're starting to work a lot more on uh, co-managed projects that has changed the dynamic. We're working with IT people frequently. That becomes kind of a no-brainer. They, it's, it, and you gotta think about how they found us. They started researching Unify. They started researching TrueNAS. They started researching PFSense. And they go, we'd like to integrate those things into our stack. They start looking at reviews. They find some guy doing videos on it. This is, then they go, okay, we've already picked the hardware we wanted. That person seems like an expert and we would like to pay them for their expertise to help us with the integration. That's actually a lot of how we get these projects. From there, we develop a rapport, they like us, and sometimes it expands into a more meaningful, more in-depth relationship, I guess you could say, where we may provide cybersecurity services or MSP services to them because some internal IT teams kind of look at it and go, you know, I'd like not to have to deal with these things because they're dealing with internal things, you know, 
being there with the users, but there's other aspects they may want us to take over. So that's also how we build the relationship with them. There's no, I, as I've said many times in the channel, there's no secrets. This is the entirety of how we run this company and very publicly as publicly as possible here. <laughs> oh, yes, all is well. Thank you, Matthew. The PF Sense forums. Uh, oh, I think you're having another conversation that I'm I'm missing piece of it. While I'm figuring out what to say next, go ahead and smash the like button. There's 300 viewers and 148 likes. So let's uh, make that go up. <laughs> Um, we don't mind. If someone has a good reason to use a hardware that costs less, I don't mind. Um, there is other times I'm just straight up honest. I never, like, if someone said, hey, can I use this other piece of hardware? And I have zero experience with it. And there's not much I can, like, I just don't have any way to find more information because it may be a new product or whatever. I will tell people, I have no experience with it. I, I am accustomed to using this hardware. I will work with you if you choose this hardware. That's fine. If they're the ones buying it. Um, then it, it's, you know, I only want a warranty, so to speak. When you buy something through me and you expect me to warranty, that narrows the choices a bit because you can't say, Tom, I want you to pick up this random piece of hardware and provide warranty to it. If I don't know what that hardware is, I'm like, well, I don't know enough about this hardware to provide warranty. If you'd like to buy it yourself, we'll service it. And if it goes bad, I don't know, man. I will help you replace it for a fee. <laughs> Oh, let's see. <laughs> crypto mining. I don't do crypto mining. If you would like to do crypto mining, have fun. It's uh, not my thing. I'm not saying you can't make money for it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying Tom doesn't do it. So Tom doesn't talk about it. I think video cards are overpriced. So there's my opinion. Uh, it has caused a problem of video cards being less available and less people playing games is not fun. Uh, what else do we... I don't even know what that is. Someone asked about something. I don't know what it is. Um, uh, I agree with you. Most go to certain size. Fan IT for purchasing department. They can buy equipment easily as me. In the UK, I sell... Um, and VAT has a 20% markup. Yeah, the UK has uh, VAT, which works differently than the way tax... It, it is a tax, but a different type. I don't know the details behind it. Ooh, let's get on the topic of video games, right? <laughs> Um, oh, so is it wrong to suggest an automation tool to the client if it would mean to reduce profit to that client all the time? So this is a, uh, this is a good topic. I like this one. I've watched other people and they've had, I've watched other IT companies and I had a friend that worked for, uh, another, he doesn't work there anymore, but it was interesting. The other IT company did everything on site and refuse to use any remote tools because it would reduce the amount they could charge their clients because the goal and the way they monetize things was to constantly show up at every client even if you're only there for 10 minutes you always had to bill them for a minimum of one hour therefore you could go visit and hop between clients and plug something in because they always wanted to go on site now how do you solve that well you could use remote management tools this goes back a few years this isn't that recent but what happens is eventually someone does suggest remote management and then they lose that client and they go, wait a minute, there's a better way to do it. Yeah. And you always should be looking towards innovation that helps your clients save because that allows you to scale. So if I have something like, let's say, you know, I could write an automation tool or a cron job to do something to fix a problem. And this is where RMM tools come in. I mean, without using the RMM tools, which we use the enable tools, by the way, to process things for clients and manage the updates. If we were to choose not to use that and do everything manually, there would be more hours and I could bill a lot more. So actually, yes, I already have chose to use an RMM tool as opposed to doing everything manually. And yes, that does cut into what I could be billing, but it's kind of like you need to be on the innovation side or you'll end up eventually with someone pulling the rug out from under you uh, who is on the side of innovation. So you kind of have to do that. Uh, that's important. Mm. 
Oh, yes. And uh, back to the video game comment. Yes, it is Rage 2. Figuring out the cost of a network install? I have videos on how to price cabling. Um, I have more than one. Watch my 2020 edition of how to price cabling. And like uh, Gareth Westwood said, you charge the customer to keep things running. Uh, and then you're always finding ways to make it more efficient. Yes, we're always looking at ways ourselves to make things more efficient because that's efficiency and innovation and technology leads to better margins. Um, hey, awesome. From SEK50. I don't know what that means. Um, what is an SEK? I, I know it's a form of currency, but thank you very much for the donation. I just... Someone will reply with what that is. Thank you very much. And uh, awesome. Thank, uh, I do appreciate the support. I don't recommend anything uh, Swedish Crone. All right. Awesome. Uh, I don't know of any free remote maintenance stuff. Crone or Krona? I don't know. We could probably look that up. Anyways, uh, gaming. Yes, I've been playing. Um, it's Doom, but Borderlands, which is Rage 2. That game's a lot of fun. Uh, they have, it's uh, by Bethesda. They use the Doom engine and give you that open feel like you have with Borderlands. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoy it. I've been playing it quite a bit. Kroner. I will go with the person from that area that knows what it's called. So, of course, we could all be Googling this right now. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, I don't play a lot of games. It's not, I, I usually find one game and play it. Uh, Rage 2 is a single player game. I don't know if it still is, but it was free on the Epic Store. Uh, that's why I picked it up. Um... Client onboarding is a project, but it's, is it that open-ended consulting or is it per device? It's a mix. It's not like every client onboarding is the same. Are you going to have to, you know, I've seen people say, oh, I, I wouldn't onboard a client unless I reloaded every machine. Cool. That's, that's a great thing to say, but not practical to deploy in purpose. Uh, it kind of just depends on the situation and what you're onboarding, what you're taking over, um, run through everything, load the tools. We'll, uh, maybe I will do a video just talking about a general one, but yeah, not all clients are the same. So sometimes you end up doing something slightly different. Um, how does how to's on DMZs and proxies? DMZ is uh, feels like a dated term. I would say you just set up a separate network where you put the servers on. Uh, that is. You just zone out the firewall as in, you know, you create a different subnet with rules that doesn't allow it to get to the other ones. I have a couple small office setups on there. Uh, hopefully that helps with that. I don't use the word DMZ. We use enable to monitor client devices. So that's how we deal with it. Um, it's We've been using SolarWinds for a while and now SolarWinds is en enable. They change names. Yeah. Now, sometimes you have to do lots of reloading and replacing of technology when you onboard a client because there's no other option. So that's definitely, uh, that happens. I mean, I love when we have a fresh, clean system to start with. I mean, who doesn't? I love when part of the project of onboarding a new client is also they're in the midst of, we need a technology refresh. Well, that's great because now you already understand that you need to migrate from the old things you have to new things. That'll give us an opportunity to set up new things on your network. We'll be able to document your line of business applications. We'll be able to understand the needs of your system because we're reloading it all fresh and we don't have as many gotchas. We're kind of working through them as we set up the computers. Um, that's a wonderful way and sometimes how we get clients when they're in the middle of and it's sometimes because negotiations break down and don't go well with their current it provider on those upgrade processes so 
Um, let's see. Micro segmenting networks. Yeah, that's just building separate subnets and uh, building rules. I mean, I have some. I have plenty of videos on how to build rules and separate subnets. Micro segmenting. I mean, I guess if you want to put every single thing in its own VLAN, you can, or just different subnet, not necessarily VLAN. You can get really granular but i guess you have to think about the use case and what makes sense for you first and start with the purpose uh what's your opinion on starwind i don't use starwind so no opinion it training do i do any it training for clients or end users not really we're not really a training place um i see a lot of it people seem to get into the training side of it I see it mentioned a lot. We don't really get into the training. Um, right now, it's not something we're doing, which is odd. I create lots of YouTube videos, but my YouTube videos are much more technical. So I guess I am in IT training for other IT people. Uh, my my content's not really quite as targeted for end users, but I have in the past occasionally made clips really quickly to show someone how to do something. I've, I've definitely done that before. Um, recovery services, uh, what kind of recovery service, like data recovery? Um, there's a group, there's a company called uh, data recovery group that we've used for that. They're here in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, I believe they call themselves DRG or data recovery group. Um, they're roughly 45 minutes from my office. So they're local to us. That's who we've used for uh, data recovery. The good news is we don't have a lot of people at, well, I'm not asking and getting data recovery. We have people that ask for data recovery. We have fewer people that actually get data recovery. Unless they really, really care about the data because data recovery is expensive. Um, most people, once they go, oh, it costs what? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll just re-download it out of my iCloud because it's usually a lot of uh, consumers. We haven't had a ton of businesses that had the issue but we it does happen from time to time and when it does and it's something that needs to be done data recovery group has been kind of our go-to so um everyone loves deploying new stuff and nobody loves documentation you're not wrong about that and kyle dropped a link in the chat for the data recovery group cctv software we still use some of the Unify stuff. I'm going to do some updated videos on that. I've been playing with it because uh, I've added some new features since I did my last video. Also, we still like Synology, uh, so we still use some of the Synology solutions. You know what we don't use? That one company that is really popular in the news right now. Um, I can't remember their name. It begins with a V. So we don't use them. I, I don't know. People ask me if I, about doing a video on what happened there because now we have a debrief on the series of events that um led to that compromise of that cctv system but it it sounded like they didn't have good security they didn't have good trust with vendors and they also use the same password everywhere so yeah and they also raided the people's house uh they raided the hackers for bragging about getting into it so that didn't go well <laughs> Uh, do you plan on doing in-depth videos on backup software and backup strategies? I've actually done them on XCPNG and I've talked and I've done them on SolarWinds Enable. Those are, and I've done them on MSP360. Uh, those are the softwares we use. So yes, I have done them. So if you look for backup on my channel, you'll find videos on those topics. Now, probably what is a bigger discussion would be business continuity. Um, I don't know, that's a little bit trickier one to have because putting together a business continuity plan is discussing the downtime and what it takes to restore a network. And that's, I don't know, that might be a fun talk. I'll think about that one. It's a lot harder of a conversation because it's gotta be customized to each business. And it's kind of an insurance question of what's your risk? What's your risk look like? And that's what you have to be asking to determine because I mean, cool, having a complete duplicated disaster recovery somewhere else is awesome. Keeping an office at the ready is something you could even do. You could rebuild your entire network and have it synchronized with another office, another building, just in case. Do you have the money to support that? <laughs> so, I mean, that's the far end of it, but business continuity is obviously a pretty big topic, but it comes down to risk factors. Um... How do you do risk assessment? Um, 
that's a little bit I don't know I guess I could try to come up with how to do a video on it that's I don't know it's just a lot of talking and it's not something easily talked about because there's not as much I don't know you kind of you have to kind of ask it in a different way um, cause so many of the clients, if they're using, like we've had to do risk assessment when people have legacy applications, like, look, you got to get rid of this old legacy crap. I posted a meme over in LinkedIn this morning about that. It's all the technical debt being collected. And as a matter of fact, let me pull up my LinkedIn meme. I don't know if I tweeted this or not, but I think it's relevant. And this is, this is really where the problem is. And I seen people commenting on it on LinkedIn. And this is really what we're talking about. Here's tech debt. And there's InfoSec. Like, there's a collision constantly happening for dealing with all the legacy technology. And let me define technical debt because that's what started this discussion on here. Technical debt is the concept in software development that reflects implied cost of additional network, uh, additional rework caused by choosing easy solution now instead of using a better approach that would take longer. One of the persistent challenges in trying to secure companies is dealing with the legacy software that keeps getting patched to make it secure uh, when it really should be completely rewritten. Q, Microsoft, Windows, and all the legacy things it supports. Microsoft has the challenge of wanting to be relevant and not wanting to restart everything and rework and refactor all their code. Matter of fact, some of the applications from the earliest days of Microsoft Windows 3.1, certain things would still, still even open today. Microsoft has been carrying the weight of technical debt forward which is why it's so hard to patch windows and all the problems that we experience in cybersecurity related to that. Um, it's not an easy solution and it becomes a risk assessment on a per client basis. Do they have an old line of business application that presents a risk uh, because there's no more support? And let's go further. When you have a company, we just had a company move off of a legacy system. There was no more support for the database itself. The software itself did not have an installer. We had images of the system. That was the only way to reset things up. So if something were to go terribly wrong within the software itself, there is not a way to re simply restore the software. We had images to restore. You can't reinstall it on a new system. It also ran an old system. So here's your business risk. One, it's forced you to run an old legacy system. Two, there's no support. And this software at that time was critical to the client's well-being of their company. It's where they had all their data. So you have a line of business risk of the software has no one to support the weird database software. Matter of fact, they actually commented because the company went bankrupt that wrote the software. They kept track of one developer who retired and lived in Florida, and they were able to contact him when they needed database changes as long as he was available. <laughs> so that's one of those you have to explain to the client very clearly. This is not a good thing. There's no one else that knows the software. One guy remembers when he worked there that he can help with it. You need to get off of this. Also, you have a cybersecurity risk because you're having to run legacy applications because of this. So there's a lot of factors that kind of play into it. Um, it's it's a lot of, um, it, there's just a lot that goes into, in, into that discussion. So it's kind of like you have to pick out something very specifically and I can make a video about it. Maybe I'll do a scenario-based video like what happened with that particular client. Um, how to explain technical debt clearly to management. I posted that LinkedIn post. Read my LinkedIn post. That's, that's how. Um... Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, the Linux kernel's getting bigger and harder to audit. I don't know about that. I mean, sure, why not? Uh, let's see, what else? IP camera set up a true NAS. No, not likely. Um... TrueNAS doesn't really have good camera support software. At least I, I'm not aware of how to make it work right. So I'm not likely to do a video on it. I don't use it. Um, uh, 
How much config do you do in the UI? How much in Bash? Ubiquity, we do it all through the UI and zero in Bash. We do not do a bunch of command line config or Ubiquity. We get a lot of people asking about it. We don't offer it because it's not well supported. Um, so pretty much if you can't configure it from the UI Ubiquity, um, yeah, it, there's not much command line. I mean, occasionally to reset a device, you have to go to the command line and fix things like that. But we're down to the last 15 minutes. I am cutting this off at six because I want to go play Rage 2. Or ride my motorcycle. I haven't decided which one. I don't know what the weather's like. If it's raining, I'm going to go play Rage 2. If it's nice out, I'm going to go play on my motorcycle. So, <laughs> um, what are the last questions we have in the last 15 minutes of this? I think I answered everybody's questions. I answered, hopefully, all the 45 drive questions. I was playing on a motorcycle yesterday. Someone may ask, this is a... Uh, Yamaha Super Tenere, that's my current choice of motorcycle for anyone that cares. The question comes up occasionally if I say motorcycle. So we already got the gaming thing out of the way. Go ride the bike. Yes. Um, what else do we have in here? Make sure you smash the like button. Ooh, there's a lot of people hitting the like button. That makes me happy. Um, can Zen Orchestra have a VM uh, IP in a public range. Yes, it can. There's hosting companies that use Zen Orchestra, and yes, you can put the VMs with public IP addresses. It can be done. Motorcycle all the way, no contest. Don't... Oh, I always rage on the motorcycle. I mean, that's... Why do you think I have a 600-pound, 1,200cc dirt bike? So... Oh, is uh, the picture from the Google Pixel? Yes, that is. That is... Uh, I, I love... I mean, I am always amazed at how good... It's actually taking a second to load here. There we go. Now that I zoomed in, the Google Pixel takes just, and this was kind of lower light. Um, this is a tricky thing for a camera to do because you have so much brightness there and contrast here, but it's, you know, you have to lighten it up. So there's a little bit of grain inside of this, but yeah, the, uh, the overall aesthetic of the picture is pretty good. I'm, I'm impressed with, I'm always impressed with the Google Pixel. It just does such a nice job on photos. Always so impressed with it. Oh, I did go here. We'll cover this real quick. Hey, watch Tom's vacation slides, right? No, I did go AFK uh, for the weekend. Um, I don't know of any good open source IP camera system. Sorry. Um, there, I, I'm. If there's an open source good good system for IP cameras, post it in my forums or tweet me. Uh, hit me up on Twitter. Um. Oh, yes, I am definitely doing 45 drives uh, videos. That's what we talked about at the beginning of this. Um, no, I don't think there's any extra charge for the name on the front. I believe that's just an included service with them still. Uh, you have to have a different IP on host and VM when you're setting these up. So, <laughs> Oh, here's the question. Layer 3 on a DHCP without a USG? Um, I don't... Layer 3 on Unify is a mess. I know ZoneMinder is open source. I said good. Last time I looked at ZoneMinder, it was not good. I wouldn't install it commercially. But um, I did... You know, Speaking of the Pixel, I will... Uh, I got a couple pictures... The, uh, I went up north, and uh, this is northern Michigan. I went up a lot of steps, so I took pictures of going up the steps. But yeah, this is also taken with the Pixel. It's just, it's really impressive, the uh, quality of photos you get out of it. It's just, it's wild. Oh, and video. So, yeah, I was taking video. It was still partially frozen up there, but yeah. More steps, more pictures. Anyways, yeah, uh, actually, I went to... Sometimes I actually go out and walk around in the woods. I mean, I have my phone on me, but I'm, I wasn't replying to messages and stuff because you can't. There's no internet where I am. Not where I was, I should say. Where I am now, there's internet, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I looked at Shinobi and I thought it was neat. I don't know how much progress they've made with that project. Yes, uh, that is um, Ascoda. Someone recognized it. So yes, that's Ascoda. Uh, I was up in Ascoda, and that's Lumber uh, Lumberman's Monument. That's a few hours north of me. 
I'm in Michigan. We can point out our hand where I went. <laughs> yeah, I, what Kyle said, uh, the Shinobi project seemed kind of clunky. That was probably... Um, that's probably where I'd see issues. Uh, Unify controller, I don't think it's out. I seen someone else say this, and when I looked up Unify controller, the new 6.1 series. Let me look, because I checked just the other day. Okay, I guess it is out. I, this is pretty recent. So, yes, the new controller is out. Um, I haven't seen my system prompt me for an update and it's only a day ago so i don't know yeah we'll have to see well when we do major version upgrades on unify it's scary so there's no doubt that there are undoubtedly going to be some issues i will be covering it it's out for the udm pro okay i know it's out for the udm pro but I don't, is it out for the other devices? I guess is the question. <laughs> New UNFI is full of ads. Well, the old UNFI had some ads. All they do is they're like, you should be running a UDM Pro. No, I shouldn't. But whatever. Yeah, I'm probably going to wait for the minor update as well. The last update to the major version from 5 to 6 was rough. Um, we'll see how it goes. Me and Riley will be chatting on that. That's usually how that goes. Um, oh, let's see. I want to update because a few people asked me some questions and uh, it's still in a rack back here. So that'll be a little project for tomorrow. I will throw the latest version of the Unify software on um, the Unify Dream Machine so I can cover that. But yeah, that's um, it, it always disappoints me. It's never it's never makes me as happy as it should. So your self house the controller did say to upgrade. Well, let's try. I didn't log into mine today. Oh, there you go. I, it did not yesterday when someone asked me, but yes, it's now asking me. So it says I should download the new version. Well, that's going to be an interesting project. Maybe I'll do it this weekend. We'll see how things go. I think I'd rather be on a motorcycle. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'll poke with it and see how I'll see how it goes. Multi-WAN. I don't care about the multi-WAN because I'm over it. I've already dismissed their routing hardware. So, hey, cool. Six years after you have been, well, longer than that, however long they've been producing them, six or seven years after you produce a device that should have had multi-WAN from day one, you finally rolled it out. Oh, yeah. Always snapshot beforehand. Yeah, it's a whole... It's a whole nother mess with the Unify. 6.1 stable. I It's in the stable repo. That doesn't make it stable. That just means it'll bug me to update. So. <laughs> yeah, it's always um, seven more minutes before I go do motorcycle or video games, whichever one. But the, uh, yeah, the, I, I don't know. The last Unify update was rough. So now that they're at 6.1, we'll see. I know that I was already tagged in some Reddit posts about it. Um, someone had asked me about um, where they moved everything. Wait for Tom to do a video about where they move things. Cause that's what people are complaining about. Is And this is where Unify is kind of confusing. They're working on a new UI, but they are not all the way there. So some things are in the new UI. Some things are in the old UI. And this has actually been kind of an aggravation with the update is figuring out what's where. Because I don't like the fact that you have to switch back and forth. That's kind of annoying. Can I do a POV on my bike? Um, Probably. I, I actually have a couple of videos. I'm not a... I don't know what to do. Like, I thought about 
do I, because people have asked like, hey, start a channel on motorcycles or whatever, or cars. And I always feel weird. So I don't really watch those videos that much. And I've tried watching, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is it that people like? It's kind of strange to me because I watch some of them. And it's just a person walking around. Yeah, I'm getting new tires on the car today. Hey, look, I'm getting this on the car today. I don't know. There's not any, a lot of the people out there don't have a lot of deep content or it's someone just showing you how much they can trash a car. Uh, those are kind of fun. Sometimes there's a uh, channel where uh, I've already forgot the guy's name, but he just does some wild things with his trucks and sticks big tires on them and drags stuff around. And that's novel. Uh, I'm not really likely to go do that. Uh, you have to, you can make a lot of money doing a channel like that because the views for you trashing things makes a lot of money so you can have money to go buy more things to trash and get more views and it's kind of a fun cycle of things but i mean i, I uh yeah i'm not exactly sure like i i don't really feel uh that so it's not my thing i don't watch a lot of those videos because i don't think i connect with them very well so i probably wouldn't connect with an audience as well i mean i've certainly crashed my motorcycle it's dirt bike i i get it in the mud and uh I definitely knock it over a lot because mud. Um, I had it here. I mean, I, I, I just, uh, I got, I fell over and I couldn't get it back up. The, these feet marks are Tom sliding in the sand and realizing I was just, I knocked the wind out of me when I knocked the bike over too. Um, cause I was going, not real fast, but fast enough. And uh, I slid, I fell over, I tried picking it up, and I'm like, okay, this isn't happening right now. And uh, I'm not picking this thing up, so <laughs> I just let it sit there, and I'm like, I'll take a picture of it. <laughs> what else was I going to do? So I do fall off it sometimes. I guess that's entertaining. Um, I take it to a lot of sketchy places, or I drove... Where's my favorite sketchy bridge? I should stop driving over this bridge. I, I feel as though this year the bridge is much worse than it was before. I think I have a picture of it. I usually drive over my smaller motorcycle, but this bridge is getting pretty sketch. I, I rode over it. Um, this was last summer, but I this year when I rode over this bridge, it looks a lot worse. And uh, it's actually, it's about a 15 foot drop under this bridge is a creek. So I should probably, this is my other Honda. Um, yeah, I could do motorcycle videos. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> oh, anyways, it's down to the last three minutes. Any other questions? Oh, uh, let's see. 10 p.m. in the UK. You know, I'm in my 40s now. Um, so it hurts more when I fall. I don't bounce as well. So that's definitely, that's definitely a thing. Do I do a super micro BIOS walkthrough? What would I walk through on it? What do you want to know about the super micro BIOS? What would I cover? I guess I don't know what you'd want out of a super micro BIOS walkthrough. Take the 45 drives to the bridge. I have no idea why I would do that. <laughs> uh, what do I think about the Brave browser? Boy, they had a big security flaw a few weeks ago. Here's my problem about switching different browsers. Firefox and uh, Google Chrome. Google Chrome being what I use for business. Firefox is what I use for personal. One thing about them is browsers are what it's not just the firewall anymore that stands between you and the greater internet. The browser is your threat surface area more so now than it ever has been. And because of all the functionality they built in the browser, you really have to work hard to keep a browser secure. Google Chrome has done a solid job with their whole ecosystem of keeping the browser secure. So has Firefox. They have also done a good job of keeping the browser secure. Now, it's 
privacy oriented questions, I'll agree with you that Google Chrome has done a poor job of privacy, but they keep all the data for themselves and they don't want it going to anyone else, hence why they keep it secure. Uh, but this is also makes me very hesitant before I try any other browser. There were some uh, flaws in the Brave browser with a couple missteps they've had, and it makes me worry a lot more that me trying to try some other browser would be the cause of some infection or problem coming on the computer. So I've pretty much stayed with the mainstays of Firefox for personal and Google Chrome for my business. Uh, Cause people do ask me why I use Google Chrome at all because they don't like privacy implications of Google. And I'm like, I use G Suite for my business. So the business things are all done there. This way having two separate browsers keeps a clear separation between personal Tom and business Tom. Uh, so that's why I do it that way. And if you like Microsoft Edge, knock yourself out. I, Microsoft is probably, um, they're reasonably on top of security for it, I assume. I don't really do videos on Samba servers. Um, I don't, there's not much to talk about for IPMI and chassis management. I, I, it exists. It's cool. It works. I mention it. I'll mention it in this video, but I don't know that it needs a tutorial dedicated to it. Yes, there were definitely some Chrome issues, and this is where that problem comes in. They are very on top of it, and they're fixing it. There's always issues in both Firefox and Chrome. So third parties that base their browser on other browsers are now one more layer down to get those. So you now can have either one of these browsers having a flaw, and then some browser being based on those can be downstream, but that's the problem. They're downstream, so that flaw could be a bigger problem for them. So it's a lot to think about. And I don't use Windows, so uh, I don't ever use the Edge browser. But I'm going to wrap it up here. It is 6.01. Thank you, everyone, who smashed the like button. Thank you, everyone, who's still here. There's still 261 of you, even though I got off topic showing vacation photos and motorcycles. But that's all right. Sometimes I talk about a little personal stuff. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> let me think of anything else. Ah, uh, any, nope. I think we've covered all the questions I have time to answer for now. So thanks everyone. Join me in the forums for a more in-depth discussion where I do spend at least a couple times a day, a lot of time replying. Um, I think I didn't look, but I think the weather might be nice out. I have a picture on the screen and not the usual background. So I don't always eat dinner late. I usually eat during the day and then I don't eat as much later. I'm not a late night eating person. So uh, I'm a late night, have a beer and play video games person. So that's what I'm going to go do. Uh, but it's not late night yet. It's only 6 p.m. here. It's later for some of you over in Europe, and it's early for some of you over on the other coast. So, and again, thanks. Awesome. And uh, my live streams, if you notice, we're also, me and Jay are doing the the home lab dot show. Uh, that will be live very soon for uh, the whole, we made a podcast out of it. I don't know that this is going to be a podcast because I have a visual element to it. I don't know that my babbling on Thursdays is good for a podcast. Let me know in the comments below if for some reason you think it is. But uh, the Home Lab is designed to be a podcast. So the Home Lab show where we talk about hardware and things like that. Um, yes, we're working on that. So, all right. Thanks again and bye.